Welcome to TYT Interviews. I'm Dave Kohler. I'm here with Ramesh Srinivasan. I'm going to explain first why am I here instead of Cenk or Anna or someone else. It's because Ramesh does some work in Bolivia and Bolivia is near and dear to my heart, so I want to talk to him about that. Why is Ramesh here? Ramesh is here because you have the most interesting job in the world. Professor, uh, Associate Professor in Information Studies at US UCLA. You're multidisciplinary. You studied engineering. Now you get to travel to Bolivia to talk to people and observe them and then write about it and talk about it and think about it. I can't think of a better job, so I want you to share all of that with the uh, audience here. Thank so you. that's why the two of us are here. Welcome to TYT Interviews. Thank you for having me. Uh, and this is Dave Kohler style, so we're going to get into this from a direction that you probably didn't expect now. So you're formally trained as an engineer, right? right. You can't deny that. Would you consider yourself now, at least in part, an ethno eth ethnographer, <laughs> I'm, if I'm pronouncing it correctly, at least uh, in the work that you do? Oh, absolutely. Absolutely. Okay. Yeah. So, who is the greater human, Claude Levi-Strauss or Steve Jobs? Claude Levi-Strauss, without question. Oh, really? Why? I'm actually deeply disturbed by how Jobs has been de oh, I am deified too. and put on a pedestal with all these, you know, dramatized films. How much did Jobs give to charity? Like well, he just died. Nothing. I don't know how yeah. much he's going to. How oh, much well, did Claude well, Levi-Strauss well. get to charity? Probably not. Great much. ideas and great concepts and the power of totemic diagrams and mm. non-Western thinking. But no, he wasn't a humanitarian per se. Right, but, but his studies were very up. insightful, though critiqued in many ways. But that's an academic conversation. Okay. Yeah. Emil Durkheim versus John Roebling. <laughs> You Emil, don't really Emil, have to uh, this. You, you got me. Emil Durkheim, for sure. You're really going to. Emil Durkheim's the... concept of anomie is basically this feeling, and I think we feel this quite a bit these days in today's world, and perhaps even in the United States. It's the sense of placelessness. I mean, you can see the divisiveness between liberals and progressives and conservatives, and how we don't necessarily feel connected as a society, as a public. And that's really Emil Durkheim's concept of anomie a sense of placelessness. Mm -hmm. A sense of a lack of membership. Like you don't really feel like you necessarily belong to some sort of civic institution or society. And I think that's what we're trying to create here with the Young Turks. Right. And, and those are ideas that are, have lasted in human society that we're still thinking about century after his life, whereas John Roebling built bridges and someone else would have built the bridges if he had it. Sure. Two more. We're not done with All this. Right. Margaret Mead versus James Watt. We get the point. We value the, <laughs> the thought, the thoughtful people who, who reflect upon human society more than the engineers who, de who de de uh, you know, developed one thing, even though the steam engine is or, fairly important. Or we think about how we can think of engineering and mm -hmm. technology in more creative and empowering ways by thinking about human beings. Yeah. And so that's the sweet spot that I'm trying to focus on, all my writing's trying to focus on, and I recognize working and living in laboratories that simply producing gadgets and assuming that that would liberate people or empower the whole world, that was not close to enough. In many cases, this was just a fetish or a fallacy, but there's something really beautiful about collaborating with people and communities and seeing how I can be of service. Right. And in that sort of space, technology can be valuable. And what technology means can be very opened up. Now, finally, this one might throw you. Victor Paz Estensoro versus Evo Morales. Ooh. Do you even remember? Evo Morales, absolutely. Victor Paz Estensoro was leader of Bolivia in a very genuine people popular revolution in the 1950s right. that gave a lot of yes. progressive rights to, right. to the population. But oh, Evo Morales question. had more of an impact? Well, certainly more of an impact. And, and I think the major point that I want to make is the most prominent indigenous head of state in the entire world today. Yes. Perhaps. And so, and, and sort of what Evo represents, and of course we always have a bias toward things that are more recent, but what Evo represents is very, very important and very powerful and very notable in our world where we feel a lot of disenchantment in the Western world. But we need to look to some examples of progressive revolutions and progressive movements, even if they are fraught with paradoxes. Mm -hmm. And South America is a place to look at in that space. Okay, we got a lot to bite into. So first of all, I love the takedown of Steve Jobs. And that concludes that opening portion of the interview, which I think was very, it turns out, very revealing. You had a lot to say about Claude Strauss and Emile <laughs> Durkheim. And I, I like how strongly you took a stand for Evo Morales. Now, why? So 
This is not where I was going, but you and I were talking before the interview. Yeah. Why? We're going to talk about your work very specifically, the stuff you're going to write about and publish about. Yeah. But why is Bolivia important and why is Evo Morales so important? Let's get into that a little more. Right. So Bolivia is a small, landlocked Andean and Amazonian country in mm -hmm. South America. So maybe people who are normal viewers of the Young Turks and other networks may be curious as to why well, we would want to think about Bolivia. And I even thought about questions like that because I was working in the Middle East before and in countries like India, and I was looking at the Arab Spring. Well, the reason why Bolivia is extremely interesting is because it is a, it is a country that really embraces in its rhetoric and in some cases in its practice, this idea of indigenous communal identity, right? And that's, there are tensions there, but there are basically 36 indigenous kind of populations or nations. They call it plurinacional, mm -hmm. right? So yet there's a nation state, the Bolivian country, right. that is headed by an indigenous person. Now it's not sufficient to say, oh, it's just indigenous people and that's important. But what these people represent, how they're trying to hold on to their traditions, their perspectives toward issues like climate change, their perspectives toward free trade, their perspectives toward um, technology more generally, um, their idea that in an increasingly digital world where we're losing our sense of place and community, that they want to hold on to community and identity and place and history. That's really powerful and interesting. So in that sense, working in Bolivia represents a very fascinating kind of case study of how a sort of increasingly digital world might actually be interpreted in ways that are actually supportive of community and culture and heritage and identity. And so I'm going there in a lot of ways because it was very, very sad in many ways, what happened in Egypt, which is where I was doing my field work. Mm -hmm. And much of what I see occurring in Bolivia, you see a great sense of agency and self-empowerment and hope and determination by people and communities across the country, even if they are extremely critical at times of the government. Right. So when I spent a year in Bolivia, I was right. imme immersed in the modern Western Cochabamba. part of the Cochabamba society. I was working for an, a technical and engineering company. I had the internet and everything. But that pervasive sense of community was all around me, yes. and I loved it. it and the ever present is the feeling of the indigenous and the, the yeah. influence of the in, indigenous community or communities, and it even infiltrates into the, let's say, the, the more modern uh, com consumer world that I was in. So sure. I, that's why I loved it and, so and much. And it gives, you, it gives you a great sense of pride. I mean, it, it allows us to imagine um, what the United States might be like or other parts of the world might be like if there was more sort of Native American voice and empowerment, perhaps, right? Instead of seeing as a relic of the past, which is certainly not true. Or even in the United States today, how we might want to think about tradition and history in a way that is sort of more located in the diverse immigrants that are part of our country, right? right. Rather than seeing immigration as like a wall to build or people to keep out or, you know, rapists and murderers and, you know, you know what I'm talking about. Instead, why don't, why don't we think about the incredible diversity of our country in the sure. ways in which Bolivians think about it? And if you look very carefully, you can find that plenty of diversity in the United States, although you don't want to set one group against the other. But even just in L.A., you know, there's a little subculture in West L.A., which is very different than East L.A., which, of course, is different than South right. L.A. Seventy languages spoken in Los Angeles. Right. So, yeah. But, of course, L.A. may not be the most representative sample, uh, example of the United States. There are other parts uh, that are much more homogenous, so it'll be sure. a little more difficult finding subcultures in, in certain areas. Okay, so you're studying radio uh, in Bolivia in the indigenous communities in 2015. Yeah. What radio? That might have been interesting <laughs> in Germany in 1932, the way the Nazis used radio as a propaganda tool. Right. But Who's talking about and studying and listening to radio in 2015 in Bolivia? What is going on there? What exactly are you studying? What's being broadcast? Who's listening to it? When? Where? Why? Awesome question. I mean, people, it's, it's interesting because, you know, I'm mainly someone who studies new technologies, right? Like everything from right. mobile phones to internet fiber optic cables to Facebook and social media use, etc., right? But... An, an initial kind of inquiry and investigation into some of those themes in Bolivia led me to, to realize that there is a technology that's supporting the vast variety of communities that exist in Bolivia and has existed to support 
a range of diverse communities throughout South America, and that is the technology of radio. Now, why and how and in what ways? Okay. Yeah. Well, radio is truly a community technology, right? Why would that be? Well, you have to actually be in places like Bolivia. I mean, internet is changing this in, in other parts of the world. You actually have to be physically close to the place where the signal is coming from right. to actually be able to engage with the technology. Okay. Many indigenous peoples don't have as strong written traditions because writing actually came, you know, in many cases only during the colonial era to South America as they do oral, oral traditions, traditions, oral and performance traditions, which are profound, and we see that with many communities around the world. So radio is truly an oral medium. Here's another big thing, and this is a big failure of new technology around the world. It's so expensive to implement, and it doesn't make a lot of sense for people to pay for because they don't necessarily know what they're going to do right. with it to gain economic outcomes. Mm -hmm. Radio is very cheap. People were showing me in total MacGyver style how they were basically rewiring radio networks, you know, literally like the, you know, the, the, the cables right. and the antennas and so on. So it's very cheap maintenance and in a very sort of like grassroots hustle type of way, people can actually re-engineer these sorts of radio technologies. So the broadcast part or the tr reception part? Both, okay. both, but even the broadcast part. So in other really powerful parts of it is much of Bolivia is the Altiplano. I mean, Bolivia has a range of environments from Amazonian jungle to sort of field type areas right. to high, high, high mountain plains. Andean. So the Altiplano is the high altitude plain and the radio signal can just kick butt there. I right. mean, it can go hundreds of miles. So Aymara women have created their own radio stations okay. and they're broadcasting to you know, small communities that are where women are being entrepreneurs uh -huh. through radio. So the radio is becoming a mechanism of not just transmitting communication, but building community. So they'll say something like, you know, we're gonna have a feria, like a, you know, which is basically like a fair right. for women to sell their indigenous goods or any handicrafts, just creating small businesses. And they'll mention it on radio and all these women will come to a particular location at a particular time. So it's like a community news group in a way and as well. And radio is really transmitting that message, not cell phones, not a Twitter, not, not the internet for reasons you just explained. Really, radio is being used. Well, cell phones are also commonly used, but okay. cell phones that gather sort of data and are interactive with sort of 3G or 4G are generally absent. Mm -hmm. And cell phones are dominantly technologies used by much younger people. Radio is appealing to a wide range of communities. But it's very interesting to see this history in Bolivia and think about who's behind the table, right? Who's behind the door? Whose voices and whose discourses and whose political agendas are actually behind these radio stations? And that's sort of a, a tricky paradoxical element that I'm exploring now. Right, the other thing about radio that, that you know, tell me if I'm right or wrong about this, when someone's broadcasting a show, a program, yeah. Everyone who's listening to it is listening to the same thing at the same time. Exactly. Internet is a very individual yeah. experience. You could be looking yeah. at one thing, and the guy next to you could be looking at something completely yeah, it's different. it's asynchronous. It brings everybody together. Exactly. And let me just mention one element that I think is really, really interesting. There's a great feeling of dissatisfaction, I believe, um, in much of the world today about the Internet and about social media. We don't know what data is being gathered about us. Mm -hmm. We don't know how that data is being exploited. I'm not just talking about like the National Security Agency and Edward Snowden. Right. I'm talking about how companies might be using our data and sharing data between one yes. another. Um, about how you know Facebook seems to know things that we are doing on other sites, even if we're not logged on to Facebook. Right. How Google has 64 different ways of gathering data. Radio, in contrast, especially multiple radio stations, is a decentralized network, right? Because you're operating your own autonomous radio station that stuff is not necessarily going anywhere else as easily, right? right? We don't know the ghost in the machine of behind the, much of the internet, but we do know in many ways how to operate, how, how to operate radio. So in many ways, the, the internet was born with this kind of frontier, countercultural spirit, and ironically, a much older technology, at least in Bolivia, is kind of making that possible. So it's almost interesting to see how radio and hacker beliefs might have a relationship with one another. Okay. Now, you were kind enough before this interview to share some of your thoughts and notes in a written form. They're, un, they're unpolished, they're, they're just uh, you know, notes. And one of the themes in there that I noticed was how radio, as you just explained, is helping the indigenous communities thrive, but it's also at the same time 
potentially or possibly squashing the yeah. the indigenous community or the individuality of that or the uniqueness of the community. Can you explain that paradox? Yeah, what I basically mean is who's behind the radio station, okay. who's funding the radio station, and with what level of autonomy and sovereignty can the radio station be operated. And so what I've observed are three types of radio stations that are existing. Some that are funded by the Catholic Church, albeit indirectly, and there's this network of radio stations that represent the dominant opposition to the government that are funded indirectly, and in some cases quite directly, by the, by the Catholic Church. That's called Radio Erbol. And then there's, so that's first. Second, and most prominently, are community-run radio stations, or even radio stations that extend for large distances that are now funded by the government. Mm -hmm. So what does that mean? Well, it means there might be some financial sustainability, but radio tends to be so cheap that you don't usually need a lot of money, right. even in very poor communities. And Bolivia is quite poor on, in many cases, high, high level of income uh, stratification. Yeah. Um, so, but if the government is behind these radio stations, how much level is there for criticism? Right when Evo says, and he recently said, I want to be president till I die, right? right? And the Constitution was rewritten for his third term, which we're in the middle of now. Yeah. So there's this collision between, okay, we're pro-indigenous, we're pro-community as a government, but only if you agree with us. So what types of communities are empowered or disempowered in a dynamic where radio stations and other media projects are kind of being administered directly by the government uh, or funded by the government? And the third group are these groups of quite autonomous, small-scale, kind of guerrilla, pirate-style mm -hmm. radio stations, and those are interesting. So I basically studied this last summer all three, and one of the most interesting things I saw is, you know, I go to these places thinking I can ask questions. I speak Spanish pretty fluently, but they end up getting me on radio huh. and asking me lots of questions. Sure. So it's this... That's a beautiful ethnographic. Well, that's a lot of fun. Moment. But meanwhile, you got a bit work to do there. So, but you have you have the time. Somehow, I'll get that done. Right. Know? Can we see the map of Bolivia here? Is is that possible now? Can you show us where you uh, did yeah. your studies? Yeah. Probably uh, easier to see on that. Map. Right. So basically, um, I was in. So a, I spent a lot of time in some of the sort of Amazonian lowlands communities. And they are completely different than high Andean communities. Right. Because they're not Aymara. Evo Morales is Aymara. And they're not Quechuan, which are other Andean people that you can also find in places like Ecuador and Peru. So this area on the right is Santa Cruz, where the Pope went, actually, in his second vis part of his Bolivia visit and the longest amount of time he spent. So I was around this region of Santa Cruz looking at a range of different types of community radio stations, some okay. of which were administered by Guarani indigenous people who have cosmologies and belief systems that are pretty interesting hmm. and very animistic. I was Santa also... Santa Cruz, by the way, is the most modern city in all of Bolivia. Yeah. The city itself. Exactly. But not necessarily the department. Okay. So I was also in Cochabamba, uh, briefly looking at kind of community market radio stations. I was also in the region of Oruro and Potosi in the and high Andean the high mountains, yeah. high Altiplano. And I was looking at radio stations that were administered and run by labor unions, basically mm -hmm. coca farmer syndicates and miners. And mines and coca farming are two of the major industries, right. along with oil, which you find in the east um, in Bolivia. And then, of course, I was all around the La Paz area, specifically in this kind of unending Mad Max kind of environment of El Alto, which extends for like about 100 miles. Yeah. So I kind of covered the, the middle region, some of the Santa Cruz region, and some of the La Paz high altitude areas. But what I want to go to next is further and deeper into Amazonian communities. And it's incredible to see communities that have hardly any robust electricity that are maintaining radio stations. And you know, these are not people who are maintaining radio stations because they worship, you know, Julian Assange or something. Mm -hmm. They're maintaining it because they feel value. They're seeing value in it. Right. So that's very interesting to see. Let's go back to the miners a little bit. Yeah. Tell me a little bit about miners listening to, is it men, men in this case? Who are, Mainly men. Are They're all the, men who are mining. And yeah. what is the radio doing for their community or how is it bringing it? Uh, so the largest mine in the country of Bolivia is right here in the... Um, in, in Juanuni, mm -hmm. and there's a national radio um, called Radio Nacional Juanuni. And <laughs> mines are a double-edged sword, as we probably know well and, you're, and the audience knows well. I mean, country. mines have incredible 
incredibly environmentally devastating effects. However, mines are also um, an incredible money producer, not only for the state, the, the government that, that runs this mine, but in many cases, these miners are making a solid amount of money. Um, but there's horrible health effects and yep. environmental devastation. I observed some of these lakes and rivers that were, were insane, and I was walking through the town of Oruro, and I felt like I was in some like post-apocalyptic kind of environment. Um, so, so there's this double-edged sword, right? So the, the, radio, the radio, Huanuni, is funded by the miners. A small part of their paycheck every month, about almost like 5% of their paycheck, um, goes to support the radio station. So why do they want this radio? Yeah. Well, it's their big conversation space. They talk about issues they have maybe with um, the groups that administer the mine. Um, they organize, they kind of try to connect to some elements of like culture and life outside of being in the mines, perhaps because being in the mines is so difficult and at times uh, kind of dreadful. <laughs> yeah. Um, so, so it was fascinating. I entered, and I'm gonna, I'm gonna, you know, there'll be some photos that I'm gonna send to you. Um, I entered the mines, extremely cold weather in the middle of the day, and was amazed to see people freezing cold, wearing, you know, alpaca scarves and you know, thick jackets, you know, huddling around this microphone and talking about the uh -huh. power of community radio with me. Now, when you talk about technology, radio is a technology, but how you listen to the radio, the size of the radio, the mobility of the radio is also technology. That's Are people right. listening at home on a big unit, or do they yeah. have modern little devices that come up to their ears? Both. So you see miners who are, you know, one mile into a mine shaft mm -hmm. with uh, earpieces listening to their radio stations. Okay. Yeah. So but also at listening home. to the radio for the, the people you observed is an active activity. Uh, they're, it's not some passive thing like we would do exactly. in the United States, sit back and just be entertained and kind of half pay attention. They're, they know what they're doing. They're actively listening to get information to, to be part of that community. I mean, it's their community space, right? Right. So think about, you know, the, um, what, what are great community spaces in the world, right? Like the, um, the forum or plazas yeah. or the f sacred palaver trees in, in West Africa. This is their community space. A technology is truly serving as a community space. But it's not just a happy story, as I was trying to say. It's about the agendas behind these technologies, too. And so uh, do you have an example of the unhappy part of the story behind radio? Uh, an example of where it's being uh, used, not maybe oppression might be too strong a word, but uh, contrary to this effect, to squash the indigenous community? Or? Maybe not to squash the community, but one thing I will say is, um, you know, some of the radio stations that are part of the oppositional Radio Erbol, Red, they say Red or Network mm -hmm. in yeah. um, Spanish, um, were critical of President Morales, you know, making statements, um, you know, upon entering his third term about how, you know, he is the true arbiter and the true, you know, the true leader of all things Bolivia. And so when they made such statements, trying to open it up the space for more democratic dialogue, um, they were referred to by the president as enemies of the state, um, as anti-Bolivian, um, and so on. So these are, these are some of the challenges that I've seen with radio. Another big issue is there's such a sort of positive connection to radio by generally poorer and more rural people in this country that any sort of space or openness or belief in newer technologies or perhaps any sort of quote unquote modern uh, innovations um, is sort of seen as, oh, well, that's not for us. That's not gonna work for us. And so there's a failure partly historically all over the world. And we see it today with what projects that Google and Facebook are doing, you know, flying drone aircrafts over Africa to spread internet access. But there's this failure that uh, the, uh, around this belief that you can just simply bring technology to people and they will come, right? Mm -hmm. um, so that sort of failure existed in places like Bolivia with telecentros or these kind of community technology centers. So given a response to that, many people in Bolivia see technologies as, and digital technologies, especially the internet and new computers, as just not for them. They don't understand why that is, like right. why that's important for them. Now. The way the economy works in Bolivia, of course, needless to say, uh, is very different than in the United States. In the United States, there was massive uh, 
consolidation of radio and, and television, of yeah. course, over the decades and homogenization, right. and then everything became giant networks. I don't imagine, that's because there was a lot of money to be made. Right. There's not a lot of money to be made in Bolivia. So am I yeah. right We said Fox just bought not... National Geographic, I oh, saw. Oh, I didn't see yeah, that. Okay. Yeah. Well, that's unfortunate. <laughs> But uh, am I right in thinking that that kind of consolid consolidation and nationalization is not likely to happen anytime soon in radio in Bolivia? There's not going to be the miners are not going to be listening to some national program that has no substance to it because the national message is extended flexibly through local channels. Okay, so that's much more subtle and and intelligent in a way, right? I mean. When we imagine us tuning into a radio network or our own kind of decentralized technology in the United States, and we aren't just getting, you know, sort of the Fox News American exceptionalist kind of rhetoric, but we're hearing things about our own communities and our own identities, but in ways that are consistent with what the government wants us to hear. So that's much more clever, right? Right. Yeah, yeah that's clever and insidious. Insidious, it could be. And maybe empowering, but maybe. you know, there, it all depends on the political economy behind these projects. Also, in your notes, uh, you mentioned something about uh, the a denial of technology to the communities other than radio. Uh, if you remember what that note was, who was denying what to whom, or do you do you know what you were referring? Yeah, to? I'm just I'm basically just speaking about um, the disconnect between um, the software libre community, which I've also been studying. And the software libre means free and open source software community. And this is a community of younger, upper middle class, uh, urban individuals who see figures across the world like Julian Assange or Aaron Schwartz, you know, the guy who kind of opened up and, you know, open source guy right. who ended up killing himself, sadly. Um, they see, you know, they see these people as icons, but they, but they see anyone who is not working with their technologies in many ways as denying their technology. So that's what I was basically talking about. But basically, there is this gulf that exists between what is possible with new network technology, and I'm not meaning to dismiss the potential power of the internet in many manners with that which exists, right? And so you see this kind of concurrent existence of these different communities that talk about and think about technology, or maybe I'll say technologies in different ways, and you wonder how the internet might look more like radio, right. for example, yet maintain the power of network technology where you can access so much information. Can we digress a little bit to Evo Morales himself? Uh, he recently became the longest ruling leader in Bolivian history, which I commented on the Young Turks at some point, and it surprised me because I would have figured they would have had a dictator at some point that it was there for 25 years. But no, yeah. Bolivia is very turbulent and constant turnover in leadership. So uh, Evo Morales is the longest lasting ruler in Bolivian history. He's indigenous. Right now in Bolivia, is indigenous identity on the increase or is nationalization on the increase or both? Are they competing with each other? And what does Evo, does Evo care one way or the other? Where is he leaning? In, yeah. Is you, he trying to create a nation state or is he allowing the indigenous communities to flourish? Yeah, it's, an, it's, it's, one, it's like the big question with a, with a country like Bolivia. Um, what, what, what Evo's government is, trying, is attempting to do is um, strengthen the power of the state by claiming the plurinacional, the multiple indigenous peoples and communities of the state as part of his national agenda, right? Mm -hmm. So obviously at times, that's going to create lots of problems and lots of tensions. And these sorts of, you know, sores, you know, kind of break out at various times in lots of different places in Bolivia. But we're not necessarily going to know about this in the United States, but you know about it when you're there. You see striking miners yeah. quite a bit. You see a number of indigenous communities out in the Santa Cruz area complaining about how there's no representation of Amazonian people. 33 of the 36 indigenous peoples of Bolivia are in that eastern area right. in the, and the northern Amazonian area, yeah. right? So, so you see those complaints. So what is a typical intelligent tactic for a clearly intelligent leader like Evo? Well, one is to blame someone else for any problems that exist, common enemy. So therefore, you see that United quite a bit States. with the, D, D, yeah, the DEA, right. you know, the kicking out at various times of the ambassadors. And I'm not saying that those things aren't worthy of contempt or critique, 
but that sort of that really worked for him for quite a while. Um, a second is to absorb all the kind of indigenous identities into your umbrella uh, in a sort of careful and intelligent way, and you see that occurring as well. And the third is, and I saw this in person, is to take icons or other ideas or other people that are very popular for your people, for the people that you govern, and absorb them as part of who you are. And you saw that with the Pope's visit uh -huh. to Bolivia. And the way Evo played off that visit as part of his government's own agenda. And you were there to witness the Pope's visit, w were, you, were you not? Yeah, so what, what did you observe? Uh, that, that was a very fortunate uh, circumstance. Or... Wow, that was quite something. Um, it was incredible. So the Pope flew south from Ecuador, mm -hmm. um, and I was out in the streets of La Paz, which is the capital of the country. The Pope only has one lung, so um, it was a very short visit. And the airport in La Paz is even higher. It's about, I think it's about 13,000 plus feet high. Right. So it's very difficult. Um, the Pope, I was, I was out on the streets of La Paz with some community radio folks that were funded by the uh, Catholic Church. Um, there were hundreds of thousands of people around me everywhere. Um, we were standing on the street and everything started late in typical Bolivia time, um, perhaps for whatever reasons, the Pope came quite late. And Evo handed, and we all saw this on television, Evo handed the Pope a cross that was created by, a symbol that was created by um, a liberation theology Catholic priest, but the cross was connected to a hammer and sickle. Uh -huh. So it was an incredible symbolic um, political move, maneuver. Right, and so people were totally fascinated by that, and we even saw that on the front page of the New York Times. Right. So it was incredible to see that moment, the absorbing of this pope, who was actually very popular in Bolivia, unlike other popes. Yeah, well, this pope's popular in everywhere, unlike Because other. he's South American, right. because he speaks similar language to uh, ideas that are um, popular in Bolivia. Uh, ideas around climate change, ideas around you know, greater peace. Yeah, income equality, equality and not right. he wants the corporations not to you know be rapacious capitalism. <laughs> uh, although the hammer and sickle, that's a totally different set of symbols. That's, that's right. hardcore twentieth century communism. I don't know why, why that's by yeah. Evo where Evo was going with. This it. was an image that was created by um, a um, a Catholic priest, a liberation theologist priest, who I believe was of Bolivian descent, who was gunned down by you know. Mm -hmm. fascist colonial you know residue regimes in the right. past um, his specific name is um, I don't remember but I know that he was a big symbol people were talking about him quite a bit in Bolivia and quite a bit after so it was a reviving of this particular symbol but he himself probably you know sort of appropriated that symbol symbols well, are very powerful in places like sure, Bolivia. yes yeah. yeah and that's what I like about the place it seems like what Evo's doing is so much smarter there's a word you keep using about him and, and subtle and more careful than, for example, what happened in Venezuela, where right. Chavez and his successor just pounded their ideology yeah. on and created a mess. Yeah. In Bolivia, the country is doing well. It remains to be seen what the result of this Evo era will be. But it's not, at this point, it's not a problem or a major problem or a disaster by any means. Yeah. There's a lot of positive There's a great deal of pride. Of course, there are folks, you know, on the left who believe that what is what still exists is a neoliberal system. So, what does that mean? Open markets, but maybe not everything is privatized. Everything's nationalized. But there's this kind of deregulated way of um, trading assets and commodities. And mm -hmm. so, you know, some folks tell me that you know Evo uses all this sort of rhetoric of you know being pro-indigenous and you know making sure everything is nationalized, while on the other hand, actually engaging in a number of actions with um, you know, groups like the, the World Bank and the International Monetary Fund and so on. Well, some might say he's talking out of both sides of his mouth. Others might say he's trying to do the best of both worlds. So, uh, you hear both. You hear right. both. And so, so folks you know, who are on CNN and so on say, the, um, Bolivian you know, kind of uh, intellectuals and journalists, they say what's happening is a double code, right? You say one thing, but you might mean something else. Right. Well, this is a great discussion. Uh, we do have to start heading toward a wrap-up, though. But I want to talk, going back to what you're doing 
first of all, you're working on a book. When do you expect yeah. that to come out? And I'd love to talk to you all about and that. And you um, certainly will. Great. So that's probably going to come out in October. I want that book. It's a called, year from now, or a, uh, yeah, a li okay. little, yeah. It takes a long time for these sure. presses to um, to print, to actually print and produce these books. But the book is called "Who's Global Village." So "Global Village" was a term uh, popularized by Marshall McLuhan, you know, uh, uh, who was in the movie Annie Hall right, very briefly. Right, guy from Annie Hall. Right. And he was basically this was his prediction that a technology would exist to make the world a global village. And my argument is not only does that not exist. It shouldn't exist because who gets to write that global village? Who is in charge and in power in the idea of collapsing diversity into a global village? So that's a book that's coming out where I'm telling stories from my travels around the world. You don't think the internet is making a global village? I can watch the same thing as some guy in Africa. You, you can potentially, but what your Facebook feed is looking like is very different than that guy in Africa's Facebook feed. And that guy in Africa, if he's using Facebook's drones, to access his internet is only going to see certain websites that Facebook Controls. decides. You're right. right. So we're and and the largest internet that exists isn't the global kind of English language internet. It's the Chinese internet, which exists massively in parallel, because of language right. and because of you know kind of the regulation um, to the kind of in an English language internet. Um, Twitter is a very African American space of use. But maybe people who are not African American may not be necessarily exposed to those conversations. Right. So there's a lot of bubbling that's happening. And I'm not saying that the bubbles are necessarily bad. I'm saying who is in power of some of those bubbles. Yeah, well, the internet is everywhere, but it's such a complex technology yeah. that yeah. you it has to be controlled by some corporations or governments, and then then it's not the people's anymore. Yeah. And just we gotta remember, and this is what I'm really up to with the book and everything else, we gotta remember that the internet or any technology is a tool. And tools are created by people who come from particular cultures, might have particular political beliefs, might have particular economic interests, and they're created based on those interests. So the internet or any technology, maybe not the internet itself, but the technologies of the internet, can be created in the image of diverse peoples. And that's my interest in Bolivia. Okay, right. So what I've set up across the University of California system is a digital cultures lab where people are working on every continent around the world doing really fun stuff, kind of like what I do, right. and exploring you know, e-waste, hitting the shores of Ghana. Who knew that, right? Yeah. Or how labor is being outsourced through call centers from India to Nigeria. I mean, just fascinating, interesting dynamics that are occurring in the world. How drones are changing politics and economics all over the world. These it's are the things we're looking at. Now, is the Digital Cultures Lab something that the public can begin to access and enjoy, or is it mostly for the UC community? Or no, I want it to be a very public kind of entity because I feel like as, as we are in good universities, we need to contribute to the public. Right. And so we have um, events. Some events are going to be open to the public. We, are, we have a website, digitalcultures.net.net. Uh, we have you know, Facebook and Twitter and social media accounts where people can interact with us. And some of our events are really cool, and we want people to publicly attend. So, for example, we have something next year where we're having a conversation with a number of Native American communities around the United States and definitely California about climate change and mm -hmm. how media and technology can aid their own ideas and visions because they're being affected disproportionately right. by climate change. Uh, we're doing an event uh, around Black Lives Matter um, in South L.A. in just two weeks with a bunch of high school students who are in, high, in a high school or in three high schools where there's basically a school to prison pipeline. And right. people don't even realize that this exists here in the United States or even in Los Angeles. So we're doing these events. We want to, to kind of contribute to the public to help us rethink technology in the image of activism, in the image of public, in the image of democracy. Will people who are not in LA somehow be able to participate in that event through the internet? Is there any kind of streaming work, or tweet? Yeah, know? we're working on that. Definitely through our social media accounts. Yeah. Um, we're gonna create mechanisms for that to happen. We just started, I mean, it's, right. it was sort of an idea and a belief that I had. We need a better way for our university institutions to be more publicly engaged. Uh, we have an event also on drones in April at UC Davis. Okay. Um, so, you know, there are, all, there are these amazing scholars who are thinking publicly but are not necessarily engaging with publics because in our universities we're not always incentivized to really contribute 
outside of our own worlds quite to the extent I believe we should. Um, and that's really why you know, I want to engage with you guys as much as possible. Yeah, well, you'll be back on here, if not sooner, uh, certainly in about a year when the book comes out. And don't forget, Professor Srinivasan's already had two interviews on TYT interviews, so check those out if you've gotten this far in this one. One last word on Aruru. I spent six months there. Yeah, it's post-apocalyptic. It's contaminated. There's not a single green thing there. There's acid mine drainage oh, yeah. and dust everywhere, and I loved every minute of it. I know. It, so. <laughs> it's, 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 it's incredible. There's something... There's an experience that we all can have that only really can occur when we actually transport our bodies and minds and sort of spirits to other places. And there's really nothing like that. There's really nothing like being in other parts of the world and learning from other communities and trying to be collaborative about right. that. And you, you know? can't fight it. You can't say, oh, wait, why don't I have the conveniences that I have back at home? No, if you're in that other part of the world, be in that other part of the world. And there's a lot of really great conveniences actually in Bolivia, like wonderful sweaters and um, wonderful people where you can just talk for a long time. And coca tea, you know, which we can't have in the United right. States. Well, it makes you feel great. Sure. <laughs> Although your list of conveniences in Bolivia was this long, your list of conveniences in the U.S. is much longer. You're not going to convince too many people based on the comparison of sure. conveniences. Sure. But a state of mind, yes, that's what you can get in Bolivia. So yeah. thank you for coming on it's again. It's my pleasure. Professor thank you, David. Us, and I'm glad yeah. to do it. And uh, yeah, come back for more on TYT interviews. Thank you.